now an eighth special presentation. In this edition of Art Beat Nation, witness the intersection of nature, upholstery, art, and beauty. I think that our ideas of nature and beauty are constructed and very intertwined. A church demonstrates how jazz is also an avenue for worship. It's sort of fun to have the music that we play impact people. See where sculpture and jewelry meet. I think I was a magpie in a former life because I'm just drawn to things that sparkle and glow. And meet an expert stone carver. People think of sculpture as shape and form. It's really light and shadow. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Beat Nation. Funding for Art Beat Nation is made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you. Kate Casanova is an artist who pushes the boundaries of human comfort by using various mediums such as mushrooms, live hermit crabs, and photography. She seeks to find where the human perception of beauty and nature fuse together. this thrift store chair and remove the stuffing from the cushions and reupholster it and plant it with straw that's been inoculated with mushroom spores in order to create a piece in which live mushrooms grow from the cushions of the chair. I always try and match the style of the chair with the type of upholstery to the type of mushroom so that the visual elements play off of each other. In this case I'm going to be using uh, lion's mane mushrooms which grow in these large white clumps that have these sort of um, tendril forms that come off of them and so I wanted to contrast that to the angularness of the chair and then the lush red of the velvet. In my process I'm always looking for new ways to see both nature and beauty. I think that our ideas of nature and beauty are constructed and very intertwined. I think we get a lot of our ideas of beauty from nature. So I grew up in northern Minnesota on the Minnesota-Canadian border, International Falls, Rainy Lake, and quite a bit of my childhood was spent um, in a home that was in the middle of the woods. We had sled dogs and always a plethora of pets from rabbits to uh, guinea pigs, the standard fare. So I spent most of my time playing with my brother outside and friends and exploring. And I think that my visual vocabulary assembled itself from, from that environment. This is straw that is inoculated with the mushroom spores. Uh, it's been pasteurized, so there's no other pathogens in the straw. It gives the uh, mushrooms a uh, good opportunity to sort of completely take over and colonize th this substrate. So this is what the mushrooms are going to feed off of for the next couple months. The mushrooms will probably start to sprout in about two weeks, and then hopefully in four weeks they'll be in full bloom. We'll see. I think Kate is a very interesting and exciting young artist. She has an intelligent sense of wonder about the world around her. So she's responding in a way that isn't simply 
emotional or intuitive. She's also responding in a way that's very thoughtful and intellectual. And it's that combination of being intuitive and intellectual that's quite unusual. I'm drawn to aspects of nature that are sometimes unnerving or um, underappreciated. You know, mushrooms, for example, they're a decomposer. They're uh, a very necessary agent of life, but not necessarily one of the most appreciated forms. She doesn't simply use one particular medium. She's made sculpture, she does installation, she's done performance. Uh, she's made some gorgeous collages with, with photographs that are very beautiful. She's made videos. So she works in a variety of ways, and in that sense her work is eclectic. The medium changes, but the, the interest in um, cultural perceptions of nature is the common thread. For example, I have a video of uh, hermit crabs that are crawling in my hair. The hermit crabs are the figures in the landscape, and so often that role is reversed, especially in, um, in old paintings. It's, it's always the human that is the figure in the landscape of nature, and so it's a role reversal. So it, it, it's about that, but it's also about that unnerving beauty that sort of happens when you're a bit unsure as to whether something is safe or not. It's about that um, unclear relationship between us and something else. So I hope that people, when they look at my work, they think about those concepts and, if anything else, just looking closer at the world around them. Casanova has numerous upcoming exhibits. To learn more, visit katecasanova.com. A church in Syracuse, New York, St. Paul's Cathedral, is bringing a new sound to its services, incorporating jazz into worship. We meet the musicians and the reverend who ushered in a new spiritual rhythm. Reverend, would you please tell me a little bit about how Jazz Mass came to be? Yes, well, I came to St. Paul's almost nine years ago and saw the people that were already here and began to anticipate ways that we might expand the musical offering that we had here, partly because of my own musical tastes, which are extremely eclectic, uh, and uh, knew that there was a, already a jazz saxophonist in the congregation, uh, John Rohde, who is a very committed parishioner here. He served on the vestry, and he gets liturgy. He uh, loves the traditional liturgies that we do, and because of that, because of, because of his respect for that, uh, he's really able then to integrate the more contemporary music into what is a fairly traditional service here, and a congregation that typically likes more traditional liturgies, but, but they love what we do here. I am a parishioner here and have been for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. And we started doing these um, a couple of years ago. I also put together all the music. I do the arrangements and the transcribing. And um, I'm a saxophone player um, primarily uh, and a reluctant singer. Um, but uh, that's one of the roles that I that I adopt here as well. The service is the first Sunday, right? Yeah, the services are the first Sunday of every month. And the group is, uh, w we have all played together since the mid-80s in various formations and, uh, and different uh, instrumentation as well, but we've known each other that long. And so when this kind of fell in my lap, I knew exactly the people I wanted to have involved. And uh, luckily, they were all available, and they've been um, not just willing to do it, but they've uh, 
really enjoy it and look forward to it? Um, it's going to sound corny, but it, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's more of a um, kind of my way of giving glory to God in a, a way that we can do it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you have these beautiful choirs, you have the beautiful organists and string quartets and everything, and it's sort of fun to have the music that we play impact people and to watch them be impacted by it at the Mass. That's, that's what's fun for me. People typically, especially in the Episcopal tradition, think church music has to be with an organ. And, and interestingly, I, one of the phrases that people like to talk about is ancient future. And ancient liturgical music, going back pre-Christian music, if you look at Psalm 150, um, Psalm 150 talks about praising God with lyre and harp and cymbal and stringed instruments and the ram's horn. Well, that sounds a lot more like John Rohde's band than it does our organ. We sing maybe one hymn, but the rest of the music is uh, either jazz music or uh, singer-songwriter or gospel. And sometimes we, we do things that people know. A lot of the uh, social uh, protest music from the late 60s and early 70s is very applicable in, in this place. And so sometimes there's going to be songs that people are going to be very familiar with. And sometimes they sing along. And uh, sometimes things are going to be a little more obscure, but that's what we... we uh, try to keep it as much as we can with the readings that are appointed for Sundays. The traditionalists probably are like, ah, you know, uh, but, but we have, we've had a bunch of traditionalists come around, you know, like if, how I would describe it is, is basically it's a fun, it's something different, it's not, um, it's not anything that you probably have ever seen. And if people are open to different musical experiences, you know, I think that they can find something in it that's that's fun and interesting and the cool part about this is that it's grown from the first time that we did it there were very few people involved you know or it came to the mass and then as we've done it and done it and done it a lot more people have come I think of ourselves as both uh, a center for excellence in liturgy and music but also a kind of a laboratory um, what has to maintain always is that it is done in an excellent way. To learn more about the Jazz Masses, visit stpaulscathedral.org. Andrea Lee is a sculptural jewelry designer. She takes inspiration from nature to design fashion necklaces, bracelets, and earrings from a palette of precious gemstones, crystals, and antique heirlooms. Her designs culminate in a sophisticated haute couture design. Perfect. They wanted her jewelry on so they could finish her hair. Okay. I would say avant-garde sculptural art is a very good definition for what I do and the ultimate result of what I do. Oh, that's stunning. Reaching into our bag of tricks here. I really wanted to develop something unique. This piece is about this cluster. You're ready. Yeah. yeah. I've done a lot of shoots now with models. That detailing and the models have told me that they feel different in my pieces. It brings out some sort of confidence in them. We're thinking the silver is going to look fantastic with this. They're for women who are not afraid to be the center of attention. It's cool for me to see that as a designer, to see how these pieces can transform women. It's obvious and it's visceral. This one actually sat on my desk for a week and I kept spinning on how to finish it. And I had a dream one night. In my dream I figured it out and then I 
tried that same technique when I woke up and it worked. It's always kind of nerve wracking when you spend hours and hours and hours on these incredibly intricate gemstone clusters, not knowing exactly how it's going to ultimately play out, knowing that you're always kind of taking a risk. Wow. It's like a chess game. I always have to be kind of three moves ahead at any given time. So I have to make little adjustments while I'm designing in order to manipulate the design to go where I want it to five moves down. A piece is not finished for me unless I say, man, that is awesome. The clusters in my signature collection always start with a primary piece that I pull a color palette from. And then I just draw from that color palette and I pull gemstones that have shades or tones of that same color palette. These are I'm going home with Andrea. Shopping for beads is probably one of my favorite things about what I do. It's the genesis of creativity for me. This is definitely going in the bag. I'll probably buy at least 10 different shapes per collection and then 10 different colors, but all colors based off of the center stone. So I'm looking for anything that's going to complement some of these stones here that I'm going to use as main center stones, complementary in color or texture. I've learned over the years that the more variance of shape that you have, the more interesting your cluster is going to be. A lot of people will get inspiration from nature or a poem or a song. I get inspiration from nature, but it's in the form of beautiful glittering gemstones. I think I was a magpie in a former life because I'm just drawn to things that sparkle and glow. Oh, look at this. It's like fireworks in a stone. I actually think that the stone's flaws contribute to their beauty greatly. Mother Nature knows color theory like no one else. It's almost cheating, really. One time I was inspired by this epic sunrise. My entire room was lit up magenta, and I remember going outside and just saying, I need to make a piece out of this color palette. Art should invoke an opinion. It should be seen. Art should have the chance to create reaction. To learn more, visit andrealee.com. And now we meet Walter Arnold, a Chicago stone carver, so passionate about his craft that he followed it all the way to Italy. In this next segment, he tells us what it takes to be a stone carver in the 21st century. I don't know about you, but when I've seen carved stone in old buildings or in cemeteries, I never really thought about the fact that someone actually carved it. Then I met Walter Arnold. He carves a lot of stone, and he's been at it for a very long time. First time I took a chisel to a piece of stone, I was about 12. By the time I was in my early teens, it was what I wanted to do with my life, and it was never a question for me, the way it is for most people, of what or why. For me, the question in life was always just how. Arnold grew up near the University of Chicago, where a plentiful supply of gargoyles can fuel the imagination. When I was in eighth grade, I used to ride my bike around after school looking at the gargoyles, wondering if that could still be done. He still has his first effort, carved with screwdrivers at age 12. Today, his work is a bit more sophisticated. This is one of nine urns in French limestone that he's making for a private home on the West Coast. It's almost done. I'm just finishing off the garlands here coming down from the lion. The garlands on the other side here are finished. You see there's a bit more detail, shadow, undercutting. People think of sculpture as shape and form. It's really light and shadow, and that's what I'm working with here to give a movement and flow to the leaf, making it more naturalistic and come alive. Over the years, Arnold's work has run the gamut from statues and fireplaces to fountains and, of course, gargoyles. 
That's his gargoyle eating a hamburger at the Medici restaurant in Hyde Park. And those are his monkeys on the primate house at Lincoln Park Zoo. As a teenager, Arnold was so determined to learn stone carving that he dropped out of high school and showed up at the National Cathedral, which was under construction in Washington, D.C. The stone carvers there turned him away. Undaunted, he continued to learn on his own, but he knew he needed training. That's tough to find in the States, so at age 20, Walter Arnold followed his passion to Italy. Within three days of landing there, I'd found a shop where I could work with a couple of old craftsmen who, basically two guys, between the two of them, they had 110 years of experience at doing this. So it was two of them and one of me was, and five and a half days a week was a pretty good teacher-pupil ratio. Now, when I imagine a master stone carver at work in Italy or anywhere, the scene does not include the noise of Walter's pneumatic or air-powered hammer. This is what stone carving should look like, right? Well, Arnold uses both methods, and he bristles at the notion that his air-powered hammer, which was invented in 1880, is somehow cheating. It's the same chisel, it's just whether this or the mallet are on the backside hitting it. The chisel isn't even attached to the air hammer. The pneumatic is doing the same thing the mallet does, the difference being a mallet, if I want to cut this far, I'll do 10 large strokes. This will do 100 little strokes, but in less time. So it's both faster and smoother and more delicate. But people want the, the romance of you with a hammer. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then they want us to go into the quarry with our bare fingers and peel out the stone that way. <laughs> Walter Arnold says he's been able to earn a living as a carver since his late 20s. The demand for stone carving has shrunk dramatically, of course, but so has the number of carvers. A hundred years ago, there were a hundred stone yards in the Chicago area, and each one had carvers. So you go down the old streets in the old neighborhoods, and all the buildings have carving on them. It's not that it was cheap. At the time, carvers earned a living equivalent to what lawyers would earn. But it was an essential valued part of life that you would incorporate that when you would build a building or incorporate sculpture in a garden. Today, he says, there are just a handful of carvers in the Chicago area, and most of the work they get is not ornamental. They don't get to do the pure carving, carving, you know, foliage, rosettes, faces, things like that, more than a couple times a year. After the intensive training in Italy, Arnold returned to the National Cathedral. This time, the stone carvers were more receptive, and they took him on from 1980 to 1985. Most of the time, it was a team of four of us working under... Vincent Palumbo, who was a fifth-generation Italian master carver, did a wide range of work, including the tympanum, the creation from a model by Frederick Hart that's over the front entrance of the cathedral with half a dozen human figures in it. But through it all, Walter's favorite subjects are the ones that inspired him to take up carving in the first place. In a way, gargoyles for me are like jazz, to where a lot of what I do is more like classical music. You have a score, you work specifically to it, it's all planned out. When it comes to gargoyles, I can take those technical skills and start to improvise and play with the stone and play with the, the music of it. To learn more about Walter Arnold and his craft, visit stonecarver.com. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat, where you'll find feature videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation was made possible by contributions to aid from viewers like you. Thank you.